with a tall, dark-ish, and handsome, <laughs> and handsome Zulu man, a good mix of traditional and modern, a dream, really. <laughs> everything is great, everything is perfect. And the weekend before we were supposed to leave, we were going to leave on the Monday morning. In the space of 24 hours, the relationship falls apart. It was my fault. The trip falls apart, everything was packed. My dad had made a speech. When my dad has made a speech, you know it's real, it's happening. <laughs> but it fell apart. So that winter, I fell into the longest and darkest depressive episode I've ever been in. I had been struggling with depression for the longest time, and I can imagine that this week, particularly for a lot of us, it's a topic that we've been discussing a lot in light of the news that came out this week. So. I was in this very deep and dark depression, the type where for weeks and weeks I couldn't even get out of bed. But somewhere in the next few months, uh, the tall, dark-ish Zulu man gives me a call and he, no, we didn't get back together. But we had a long conversation where he used some threats, like time is running out, you're getting old, you need to get your stuff together. And somehow that conversation, it was, well, that's just a summary, but it was a very long and constructive conversation that made me realize that I am capable of more. So I can get up again. I can start from scratch. I can start being me again. And not long after that, I had to face the decision. I had to face the fact that I had to start adulting now. So I got a job in a call center. You all have to start somewhere. Uh, it was in a call center around Randburg, and we were being paid peanuts. I had to wake up at 4 a.m. because I lived in the VAR and traveling meant you wake up at 4, you take a taxi from my stop sign. I don't know if anyone's from the VAR here. You take a taxi from my stop sign to a place called, called Zone 12. When you get there, you walk a few hundred meters to the Gordon Highway, and then from there, you take another taxi to Brie, and then from Brie, take another taxi to Randburg. So it was a mission. I was working very, very hard. I was always exhausted, but I was happy because I believe in paying your dues. I was paying my dues. I was working out there with my formal clothes and my handbag. I was that girl. I was out there. So it was the best time I gained. And I'm thinking, it's cool. It's fine. But eventually, it did take its toll. Um, in the first week of September, luckily, something changed. I found a bus. It was a Houghton Coaches bus that went right from my stop sign, 
literally to just down the road from the office. So I could literally just sit in the bus, fall asleep. And next thing I know, I'm next to the office. For that week, I was in heaven. I was happy. It was, two, it was a two hour long ride, but at least I wasn't doing the super convoluted trip anymore. So, but because it was so harrowing and exhausting still, there came a day, it was a Friday, where I said to my supervisor, um, can I just take this Saturday off, just this once? And he was like, why? And I wanted to lie and say, you know, my grandmother has died for the second time. <laughs> but I just said, I'm exhausted. Um, I've been working hard. Um, the traveling is killing me. So I, was, I, I spoke the truth. And unfortunately, he said, I can't. And I understood we had a lot of work to do. And if we do that work, clients are happy. We get more work. We stay employed. So I was not resentful. I wasn't, I wasn't mad. It's fair. It's fine. But then I had, just in case, I had asked the bus driver, like, is the bus going to be available tomorrow? And he said, yes, it's going to be available. But it's just going to go a different route down the road. So fair. That's fine. So Saturday morning, I wake up. Uh, my dad offers to walk me, and I say, no, it's fine. So I just walk down the road, just a few blocks. And then I get there, and I wait, and wait, and wait. And being me, being the spunky person that I am, I had the phone numbers to the Houghton coaches' offices. Yes. <laughs> so I call them, and I explain that um, I'm expecting a bus. I uh, was told it would be here, but it's not there. And they said, no, the bus, it will be there, but it's going to come to you just an hour from now. I don't math so good, but I did the math, and I realized that this is not going to work out for me. I will definitely be late. So I thought, OK, it's fine. Let me just go back to my old routine. It's fine. So I took the taxi to Zone 12, and, and I started walking to the highway. On that journey, I was worried about several things. One, that because I waited so long, I'm probably going to be slightly late. I'm worried about the fact that I'm exhausted. I hope I don't pass out at my desk. I'm worried about the fact that I'm wearing this white shirt for like the third time this week, and I hope no one notices that I'm wearing a filthy white shirt. <laughs> So I'm just walking merrily by, worried about all these things, and next thing I know, someone grabs me from behind. In that moment, it doesn't register that this is happening until my hand managed to touch the gun that he was holding, and I felt that it was ice cold, and I knew it was a real gun. So then I screamed. It was a few seconds, but then it it's somewhat registered that, OK, this is probably a criminal. Then I screamed, and he, uh, he told me to shut up. And the way he said it was like, me screaming was the most unreasonable thing <laughs> one could do. I mean, when a, when a stranger grabs you from behind with a, with a gun, you don't scream. I mean, who knew? So he told me to shut up, and then he told me to keep walking. So that place is called Mandela Square. It's another Mandela Square in the world. And there are stalls where people sell vegetables, clothes, accessories, everything. So they're in these makeshift shacks. So he told me to go to that corner. But then when we were walking, from the corner of my eye, I noticed another guy. And it strikes me like, why is this guy not helping? But then when we got to that makeshift shack, he joins. And I see that, oh, they're working together. It still has not registered, though. So um, they tell me to sit down and give them my purse and my phone. Because, one, I'm stubborn. Two, it still hasn't registered. I tried to argue. I'm like, no, it's an old phone. It was one of those old Blackberries. I loved it so much because I could write on it. But it was so old that I took it to the shop for repairs once. They opened it, and all the buttons fell out. <laughs> but I still loved it. I could write on it. And most of my writing career happened on phones. So I could write on it. So they were taking this thing that's so precious to me. Uh, but, you know, you don't negotiate with terrorists. They took it, and they took, <laughs> and they took my purse. In the midst of all of that, a third guy joins. And because, again, stubborn, still hasn't registered, I say to them, okay, 
can I please get my ID back? Because that was when the new smart card IDs were starting out and I did not want that. I just wanted my old green ID about eight-ish book. So I said, can I just please have my ID back? Again, terrorist, don't care. Um, so just next to that shack, there's a fence. It's very beaten down, it's very old. And they say I should jump over it. Again, two reasons, stubborn, not registering. I'm like, I can't do that. I'm wearing pantyhose, it will run. So, <laughs> no, but they made a convincing case and I jumped over the fence. <laughs> so we started walking between these houses and it was very, very odd because some of them, people were still, were already awake. It was very early in the morning, around 5 a.m. We were already awake. Um, I could see the, the lights on, I could hear some people talking, but it, I knew that whatever I did, no one would come and help because no one ever comes to help in the township. So we walked between these houses and then we got to this field. Um, and when we get to this field, that first guy with the gun tells me to take my clothes off. And because my brain is still working very, very, very slowly, I start to take my top off and he says to me like, no, don't be stupid, just the bottom part off. So I did, and that last guy who joined, who seemingly was the nicest of the bunch, he says to them like, how could they just do that? At least let them lay a jacket down for me or something. So he took his jacket off and laid it on the ground. So the first guy who was incredibly mean for the fact that I don't know this guy, he doesn't know me, I don't know why he's being so mean in the context of everything. So he went, he went first and he kept telling me to shut up and to stop crying. So I did um, and when he was done, the second one, the, the one who seemingly was nicer, he was second. Um, but it was very, very odd because to him, it seemed like normal sex. He wanted me to kiss him and all of that. And when I wouldn't, he took a knife out. And only then did it finally dawn on me that this is actually happening. This is actually real. What is happening to me? But then when that kicked in, I went into survival mode. I realized then that despite all the months of depression where you feel like you just can't take it anymore and you just can't survive in the next day, I wanted to live, I wanted to survive, I wanted to go home to my family and I did not want my dad to be called and to find my body there in a random field. So when I went into survival mode, I he kept asking me questions. He asked me if I had, about my family. And I lied and said, I don't have parents anymore. It's just my sisters. So that's why I'm going to work. I am the only breadwinner in the home. Hope, hopefully, that will appeal to him and they'll let me go. And when he was done, I said to him, I won't even look at you. I won't look at your faces. Just let me go. Do whatever you want. Just let me go. Just let me live. That's all I wanted. So eventually he was done and the two of them just, they left. And then the third guy gave me my purse back with my ID and everything. Obviously the money was gone, but he gave me my purse back and he was like, I saw everything that happened, so now I want my turn. And he, he also did something very, very odd. He took a condom out and he said, well, I need to protect myself. You never know what people I have out there. Fair enough, there's nothing I can do. He did what he did, and when he was done, he told me to walk and to go to the mall, to Mandela Square, and tell the security what happened and that they'll help me. Uh, but then, when I kept walking, he was walking right behind me, and I kept looking over my shoulder because I was still scared that he could just do something. And he found, it, he found it so funny that I was so scared. 
and he like he he kept it he, he made it seem like a joke that I was scared for my life that I kept looking over my shoulder but eventually he stopped walking and just let me keep walking forward I started running and I got to the main road and I just collapsed to the ground and likely some of the first people that found me were from the police station so we went to the police station we did everything right we did all the kids we went to to the hospital after and then we did all the kids and everything um, they were never caught um, five months later the detective came to my house and said uh, they're closing the case and I had to sign a form saying I accept that they're closing the case because of lack of evidence that day after we did everything we went home my dad said I shouldn't tell my sisters what happened but my sisters and I are very, very close. So I told them. And the one thing my youngest sister asked me, because she knew my struggles with, de with depression and everything, she said, like, am I going to kill myself? And I said to her, no, I'm not. Because funny enough, in that whole incident, I realized that I want to live. I just want to live. And because I realized that, and because I promised her that I will live. I have spent every day of my life in those three years waking up every day, even on the darkest days when depression says, you just can't do this anymore. Just end it, the pain will go away. Even on those days, and even on the days when it feels like the most rational thing to do, like I have every reason to just kill myself. Honestly, I've suffered enough. I wake up every day and I choose to live. I don't know if tomorrow I'll still have the strength to make that choice or not, but for today, I've chosen to live. And as if I have the strength tomorrow, I'll keep making the same decision.